Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Lighthouse Books. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today for the launch of the Once and Future Sex. Just going to get a little piece of paper out. Um, so, uh, Eleanor Yanega teaches uh, medieval and early modern history at the London School of Economics, is the creator of the popular blog Going Medieval and the author of The Middle Ages, A Graphic History. And she's made a number of fantastic podcasts in medieval history that you should go and listen to when you get home. Um, the Once and Future Sex, Going Medieval on Women's Roles in Society, uh, is a book that explores medieval womanhood from beauty standards to jobs, sex and relationships. It presents us with ideas about women, women from, the class, from classical philosophy to some of the earliest named women writers, from women mystics to monks, from courtly love poems to the medieval equivalent of a pickup artist. And in doing so, this book sheds light not only on the historical treatment of women, but reveals the fact that even though we tell very different stories about women today, that misogyny isn't all that different in our current moment. Um, and it's a brilliant and thought-provoking read. And please welcome Eleanor Yanega. Um, Eleanor's going to read from. Yeah. You know what? I'm so glad. This will be my mic. <laughs> Um, so. I might have to insist on the mic just for the people. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, everyone online. Okay. No, like that's this is it's we're all out here struggling. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to hit you with the introduction. Why not? Um, so in late 14th century Prague, the Archdeacon, Archdeacon Pablo Vianovitsa embarked on a tour of the grand imperial city's parish churches to see if locals had any religious issues that they wanted addressed. In the parish of St. Andre the Greater in the old town, the archdeacon was alerted to the presence of, quote, a certain woman called Donka. According to her fellow parishioners, Donka was living with and even heading a group of suspect women in the house of a man called Henry, even though she was married to one of the king's chamberlains. To make a living, the women were selling blessed herbs to customers who complained of head ailments. This arrangement was a suspect religious emergency for several reasons. First, Donka was living outside of her husband's control, while the others didn't seem to be attached to any man at all other than their landlord. Second, while the herb business was technically illicit, the fact that a bunch of women were participating in it made it seem to be pushing the bounds from standard herbal medicine into magical remedies. And third, a group of women living together like this meant that they might be running and working in an unlicensed brothel. The community concerns about Donka and her roommates shows us that women in medieval Europe had it bad, but not in the way that most of us think that they did. We know that they had a difficult time because our society was built by theirs, and women are still at a disadvantage with men. Today, women face, among other things, lower wages in return for the same work, a disproportionate workload at home, disbelief from medical professionals about our pain levels, an expectation that we will always look sexually attractive but engage in sex only with our correct and designated partners and in exactly the right amount, and sexual harassment and a huge risk of sexual and physical assault while we go about our daily business. If we're still going through all of this now in the era of feminism, it stands to reason that medieval women had it worse, lacking the benefits of the pill, the Equal Rights Act, and Dolly Parton's nine to five. Yet, we seldom take time to learn how medieval women were considered and treated in their own time and why, instead of assuming that they just faced a more draconian version of our same issues, this is somewhat true. As Dr. Ben, her pals were reported to the archdeacon who had the power to excommunicate them from the church and have them driven from their homes. In this case, however, nothing seems to have happened at all. Were the women suspect and the subjects of communal, communal monitoring and gossip? Yes. Was the church going to do anything about it? No. After all, these women seem to just be doing what natu women naturally do, suspicious stuff. <laughs> there was really no way to stop that. When we ignore history like this and assume that women have always been treated in one particular way that we are only now beginning to overcome, we accept that our society has always been this way and indeed should be this way. Our world as collective is simply responding to the natural deficiencies of women and is organizing itself to adjust for them. We tend to agree that our society is beginning to address such shortcomings now. 
yes, we assume that women in the past were treated as we are treated for the same reasons, just without the benefits of the modern world to help them make up for their own innate and natural deficiencies. The fatalism of such assumptions is rage inducing. The idea that this is how things always were and that our, our societal expectations of women have developed as a result of some immutable truth about over half the world's population is just too convenient. More to the point, it is also wrong and has no historical basis. Whatever problems we may have with women now, we don't generally agree that they are so sex crazed and heretical that when left to their own devices, they will start a brothel with a nice little side racket and magical hearse. So clearly some things have changed. If we want to understand how Western society got its current attitudes about women, we have to retrace its steps back to medieval Europe. Sadly, we often treat medieval European history as the ultimate in obscure or unnecessary knowledge. We use the term medieval as a shorthand for backward or barbaric, as something that we have learned from, moved past, and bettered ourselves as a result of. We are so sure of what we find, what we would find if we look a bit at medieval history that often we don't bother. But this attitude is not only incorrect, it is also one reason our society is not moving toward an equitable future. I was going to ask you to give like an elevator pitch, but there you, you've just done it. So, <laughs> brilliant. Um, so, I guess I actually want to ask then what, what made you want to do this project in the first place? What drew you to it? Hmm. Um, in the first place, you know, I'm, I'm a social historian, and one of my sidelines especially is, is, you know, sexuality and gender as a result of that. Um, and one of the things that I've kind of noticed quite often is uh, the way that people talk about women now um, often has this gloss of like pseudo scientificness. Um, so I'm really obsessed uh, with evo psychologists. Um, in that they are some of the stupidest people who have ever graced the face of the earth. Um, and they do these things, right? So they, they do these things where they'll say, um, oh, uh, the one that really drives me nuts is um, we've always, here, here are the reasons why men, you know, all of them, uh, prefer women with hourglass shapes. And then they have all these like really weird things where, where, where they will say, oh, it's because they know that um, they are, they are not pregnant or they know that they could become pregnant easily or all these things. And I'm like, all you have to do is look at one picture of a woman, like who's supposed to be hot from the middle ages. And it's like, oh, they always thought hourglasses were hot today. You know, medieval people, uh, spoiler alert for a chapter, it's pear shapes, baby. Um, and, uh, and, you know, often like if I'm like posting sexy pictures of medieval ladies online, people will say to me, why is she pregnant? And I'm like, she's not, she's got the, a luscious little belly as uh, Jeffrey of Vinsoff puts it, you know, and they're like, that's really sexy. So they have a completely different idea of what attraction is. And we tend to that do this kind of like, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a post enlightenment way of talking about things. Whereas medieval people are like, oh, well, Aristotle said this. So I'm going to accept this as true and kind of play with that. We kind of do the same thing of going, well, this is how our society is organized. So there must be a scientific reason for doing that. And we come up with these things that are just not true. Like, especially, you know, sexuality, this is one of the big ones where it's like, um, you know, <laughs> the whole women are from Venus thing. And it's like, well, women put up with sex in order to have relationships, really. And they really hate it. And I'm like, literally ask anybody from before, <laughs> you know, the, the 18th century. And they're like, these ladies, cool, oh, you got to lock them up, you know, and like literally to the point where, you know, there, there are medieval men who are giving advice to other medieval men, like, well, this is how you like abuse your children into staying in the house, like burn all their clothes, but they don't, they don't go out and shack, like essentially. <laughs> and you know, like whatever you want to say about women now, no one is all like, oh yeah, they're like every single one of them is sex crazy. So you cannot say that we're doing these things because they're scientific, right? So we're just doing them because we like it. And I think that, you know, taking away you know, this tool in the arsenal saying that things must be this way because science, question mark, is really, really important. Um, this makes me think, when I was reading your uh, chapter on sexuality, I kept thinking of Ben Shapiro. <laughs> and oh, yeah. Yeah, those it sounds like everyone knows me. It's based like a right wing <laughs> thinker and commentator. I think he was very generous. Um, <laughs> and, and he wrote this tweet that you might remember where I'm paraphrasing, but he was like, Of course, my wife doesn't like sex. Um, <laughs> and obviously, completely shamelessly saying that because he believes 
yeah. right? That, that women are, are, you know, desireless, sexless creatures and has kind of built into that belief a sort of that it's natural and that it's always been that way. And I was wondering, like, what does the medieval have to say to Ben Shapiro? <laughs> and this is quite interesting because what Ben Shapiro and medieval philosophers have in common is this idea that the ultimate form of women, like, you know, our Pokemon evolution, is that uh, we're all going to become mommies someday, right? Like, the most important thing about us is we'll be a wife and a mommy, right? And then that, like, and that's the story of being a woman. Um, and, and particularly why that is very important too is that, like, oh, you might have a boy and then, like, that'll be, that'll justify you. Um, kind of thing, you know, like, so that, that would be fine. Um, but the difference is for medieval people, they're like, well, the best thing you can kind of do with a woman, you make her a wife and mother because they're just so sexually ravenous that at least you're getting something good out of, you know, this inherent deficiency in women, which is their overwhelming lust. Whereas Ben Shapiro is like, well, the, women just love being mommies. They simply love to get pregnant and have babies. It's great and fun and not dangerous. And um, and women will just, that's what they want, you know? And so I think that is really important um, also because within this as well, one thing that medieval people I think are doing slightly better than us is, especially when they're like thinking about motherhood, uh, which Ben Shapiro is kind of talking about when he, when he has these discussions, uh, is they're like, oh yeah, it's really dangerous and it sucks, right? Um, and they're very open. They're like, yeah, it's awful. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, giving birth is awful. You might die. Uh, being a mum is really hard. Like, these things are are terrible. But this is kind of your penance because you're so horny, right? <laughs> and uh, now we we've gone to, oh yeah, well, I mean, like, don't talk, don't talk about you know labor or whatever and how that sucks uh, because you, the only thing you want is to be a mother and you will like you know close your eyes and think of England about sexuality. And so it's it's such a huge deviation historically from the way in the global north we've thought about women that it like it it needs to kind of like be brought to light, I think, in order for us to make these critiques and say like maybe you can't say you know what half of the global population thinks about sex possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I realized we were talking about kind of like ideas of women's deficiency and we haven't actually like maybe gone far enough back to like situate them and you begin the book obviously in antiquity do you want to talk about kind of the, the influence of antiquity on medieval thinkers about kind of like women's inherent <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely so uh, i think it's really important too because when the, the way that people talk about medieval history now if they talk about it at all is you know like they were all idiots who were rolling in film and like actually what was great was you know ancient greece and rome question mark that was great people were like really popping off like and, and doing very intelligent things and you're like well i mean actually the thing about medieval people is they care so deeply and they are so reverent about ancient you know, philosophy that they don't change these things at all. They just like slap some Christianity on top of it. They're like, you're good to go. Um, and in particular for them, um, it's Aristotle. Plato's good too. Like Plato's good too. Um, absolutely, they'll take him. But any, or anyone that they can kind of get hands on, they'll, they'll like it. But this really forms the backbone for um, intellectualism and certainly education um, in the medieval period because uh, to be literate for medieval people is to read and write Latin very specifically, like if you are, if you're doing, you know, like French vernacular, great, everybody likes it, but you're not literate, right? Like you're not highfalutin enough, so don't worry about it. Um, and the way that both Plato and Aristotle look at women and discuss women is that they are kind of not men, right? So the default human being is a man. Um, and Plato in the Timaeus has a really interesting um, origin story for humans, which is that when humans were first created by the gods who sort of come out of the earth, um, they were all men. Um, and then what happens is that if you didn't do a good job of being a man, you are then reincarnated as a woman. So like women are like that, like, you know, and then like, you know, the ones who didn't do it. Well. Um, and then for Aristotle, what he says about women is that they are either deformed men or they are inside out, men, you know, depending on, on like when, when he's writing about it. So in his opinion, of every single embryo starts off male and then something goes wrong. And that's how you get a woman. And then and then, and they're discussing and malformed. And, and so therefore, because men are what like the correct and dynamic human is, women are just opposite men. And it's, we're kind of like the Wario of men. <laughs> um, so 
so it's kind of like where men, men are like stoic and uh, and logical and they're able to uh, they're really able to uh, kind of like think their way out of things and they're in control of their emotions and you know this is what they're, they're very right and women are um, overly emotional and they are irrational um, and they're like quarrelsome Aristotle hilariously in his complaints about women list is like retentive of memory which is very funny it's like his wife were obviously like Aristotle you said you would take all the trash or something <laughs> and, like, um, so basically just anything that's good about a man is like then the evil opposite uh, in women and Medieval people are like, this is absolutely brilliant. And I'm going to take all of that, especially, um, and then just kind of like slap the garden of even on top of it. And this, like the story works in exactly the same way where you have Adam, who is the default human, right? It's like when God made a human, it was man, there it is. And then it's like, oh, well, I guess I'll make you a woman because you're lonely. Or whatever. So women are immediately an afterthought. And then they, you know, and then a woman immediately commits original sin, right? And then very interestingly, um, in order to talk about why sex is bad, because, which Aristotle and Plato do as well. Like the, the Greeks and, you know, Romans, they're not actually like sex positive, uh, you know, or whatever the people think that they are. They, they are. They're, they're always like, it's bad. You should be being an ideal citizen. If you have too much sex, you'll become like a woman, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, the church are like, oh yeah, well, original sin as well. Uh, the thing about it isn't just like, oh, then Adam and Eve noticed they were naked, which is the way we whitewash it now. Uh, they're like, Adam and Eve noticed they were naked and they're horny about it. And that's the thing. So it, it, women are automatically sexual as well. And so the reason everyone is like horny and confused all the time uh, in a society that's saying and you should just never have sex unless you're going to have children, that's women's fault. And then also, obviously, then women are highly sexualized because sex didn't exist until women did. It's like when it was just a bunch of dudes running around, according to like Plato or like before Eve, Eve was made, sex didn't exist because like whatever. And now like, so in order for sex to exist, women have to exist. So it's, automatically bundled up with that uh yeah you cannot you can't talk about the medieval period without talking about ancient history which is why it's a real mistake to become a medieval historian mm -hmm. uh because you have to do everything uh yeah yeah speaking on the idea of it being a mistake to be a medievalist um you, <laughs> you mentioned earlier how like the medieval in sort of the contemporary imaginary is like a synonymous with sort of stupidity violence you know, intense emotion, or well, I mean, yes, religious fervor. Um, do, do you find yourself trying to defend the medieval as you write or redeem it? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and this is the thing that, that kind of like drives me insane. Obviously, there are things that, sorry, I shouldn't say that, that uh, drives me up a wall. Um, and uh, because although I really hate a lot of these people that I'm writing about in the middle. You know, they're all my enemies. This is the thing I would say that's like, it's very ironic that I like spend all my time like writing about these dudes who would absolutely hate me and everything about me. But I will defend them a lot because um, actually the way that they come up with these ideas, do I disagree with them? Yes, I think that they're, it's like philosophically stupid. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and that you can't just kind of like write women off as always bad. But on the other hand, it makes sense. Like it's not, like this isn't out of nowhere, like as a, an exercise in terms of coming up with gender roles well at least it makes sense at least you're you are literally building on a tradition at least you can say okay well this is what they've always been doing and we're kind of like just doing this new thing because you know time has moved on right and that i don't have to agree with them but i can say that it's not stupid it's actually quite intelligent i just don't like it. <laughs> and um, i suppose uh, that this is kind of something that i, that I think about a lot um, because you can appreciate the thinking behind something and disagree with it, which is like, it was why, you know, a lot of the time I think ultimately like debate is useless, right? Because like, if I, I can be like, yeah, I see how you came up with that argument. I think it's stupid. Thank you. You know, and, <laughs> and, and this is kind of what I'm, I'm constantly doing with medieval people. So, but they're, they're, they're surprising. The reason I start the book off with this story about Donka and Prague, this, you know, first of all, I will make you all learn about Czech history. <laughs> like, that's like, you know, just to grind one particular axe. Uh, but secondly, because it, it does the thing where, you know, people are constantly um, using, especially the medieval church, as like this shorthand for like everyone. There, there's this real tendency, especially in Protestant societies, which we live within, to act like the church are like cops hiding under your bed. And they're gonna come get you at any moment. And I'm like, you were giving them way too much credit. Right? Like, they're like, this, this is a real disorganized 
a uh, group of individuals. So, like I assure you, like it half of the, the where I get the Donka story from, the same kind of like list of reports. Half of it is just like this priest is running a brothel. You know, like these guys are not like actually trying to like crack down on on things like this. So I think it's really valuable to kind of like have stories like that because one of the big bugbears here is like, oh yeah, and then the church ruined everything. And I'm like, I mean, they came up with some really stupid ideas that I don't agree with. Sure, sure. But they didn't really enforce that in any kind of like logical manner. And actually, you know, what people are kind of complaining about is oftentimes modern, right? And so I'm like, oh, that thing you think that the medieval church did, uh, modern people did that and they were often Protestant, you know, like but people will like use kind of like the, the church. As a, and like I mean I saw, yeah, that's it. And she's she's uh, pulling content from online now. Sorry everybody. I, I was I was just trying to have a nice time on Instagram the other night, and there was like a cute cat video, and I was like, oh, cat, you know, love that for me. Uh, and uh, th this person was like, here's a terrible story about the Middle Ages. The Black Death happened because people thought that women who had cats were witches. So in Europe, everyone killed all the cats, and that's why there were rats, and that's why the Black Death happened. And I'm like everything about this story is incredible you know, where I'm like, um there are no witch panics in the middle ages like people like in fact like to say that witches existed was um heretical and you couldn't say that that witches existed a uh, b i mean it, it was fleas baby like it, i don't like it wasn't rats anyway so like calm down i uh, like as the like okay well the plague came from kyrgyzstan so you're telling me that like the church held sway in kyrgyzstan and all their cats were, like none of it makes sense right but this is the kind of stories that people tell and also the stories that people tell about like to, to do feminism about the middle ages where i'm like well none of that is true and actually the middle ages was much better in terms of being chill about women doing magic like you know, oh, I think these these ladies are doing like herbal magic, and there was like, no, they don't leave them alone. Next, <laughs> right? So, no, like, it, it's really the opposite of what people tend to think, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess back to this idea of of the medieval maybe being used as a mirror, like, but you know, people use it now to be like, at least we're not them. Yeah. And I feel like your book does something really interesting, where, where it you know it takes you through medieval history at the same time as making you very present. In the present you know it asks you to think about when you're reading it the way in which we are reflected badly as opposed to well i think that was a clever thing you did yeah <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd like to talk more about it that'd be, that'd be great <laughs> yeah I, I think that, that that is important because um it, you know obviously when things are going badly for women which is kind of like all the time obviously you know uh, but especially you know we're at this we're at a difficult moment um, I would say, you know, what with the, the the return of fascism, uh, you know, it, it's not wrong. And one of the ten things that we tend to kind of say is like, oh, well, like these hard won rights that we've got, and I'm not saying that they aren't hard won, but we tell this really easy story about how well history is, you know, one big, you know, way like a chance to become better, uh, which is not really the story of gender and and how it works out for for women a lot of the time. Um, and I think it's as important to reflect on all of the bad things we're constantly saying about women, like as opposed to the good ones. You know, even in my lifetime, I there's been a real kind of shift in terms of the way we talk about women. So, you know, you can kind of like the 90s feminism that I was raised under, you know, it was kind of like, oh, you know, women are kind of crazy, but, you know, like we're going to celebrate them anyway. Like, and you can ask Hillary Clinton because she acts like a man and that's good. Uh, but like to actually be, um, like quite feminine would be necessarily bad. It's like you, you need to be overcoming your femininity at all times to kind of like prove your worth as a human being. We never talk about that, right? We only ever talk about like, oh, you know, uh, you know, girl bosses and things like that, which is, you know, inherently masculinized, right? It's like, oh, well, they, these women are excellent because they're, they're being masculine. So how different are we really from medieval people? Because medieval people are exactly the same. They're like, you know, there's all these like great uh, trans men saints Whereas like then like a you know a monk will die and it turns out he was trans and everyone's like well that is brilliant for him love that managed to stop being a woman for me you know and like and, and, and like so the best thing that you could ever do is like stop being a man a, a woman and become a man and they're like yeah great God loves him fantastic you know and and I also think there's a real value in that right you know like especially with kind of like you know the trans panic or winning enduring like you know there's this assumption that like medieval people must have been like oh well we've always been and gender has always been incredible. But I'm like, no, baby, like there's trans people all up in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, so there is 
but there's like a relationship to it is really different, right? I mean, like even when you have like trans women show up, uh, shout out to to Eleanor uh, Reichner who gets arrested doing sex work in London. Uh, she's doing it in the wrong place. She was supposed to be doing it in Southern. She was doing it like up against the wall of the Tower of London. Go girl. Uh, <laughs> so she gets hauled in and they're basically like, girl, what is this? And then they, like, they ask her a bunch of questions. They're like, hey, so when did you transition? She's like, oh, there's a whole stable of us in Oxford, literally. And everyone's like, I love this where you get out of here, you stamp. And then it's like, oh, you know, so I think that, you know, I think it's really interesting and important to talk about these people in order to kind of like say, you know, here, here we are in this particular political moment and we act like, oh, everything is new. And like, oh, you're just kind of pushing it a little too far. But you have to kind of think about the past in order to really critique what it is that we're doing right now. Yeah. Um, actually, there's a really interesting part in your book about sex work um, and the notion that some people believe that sex workers couldn't become pregnant. And in and in a way, that that not being able to become pregnant sort of excluded them from womanhood to a degree. And I was wondering, like, one, do you mind talking more about that? And two, are there any other people who you see as, as being excluded from womanhood, either based on class, labor, like race? That's an interesting one because, um, yeah, so there's kind of a thing with uh, sex workers, uh, you know, sex work being one of like the, the occupations that are open to women and, and normal women, right? So it's like, if you manage to escape from the farm, and you know, it's like bright lights, big city for you. The thing that you can do it, with no training and no connections is you can become a sex worker and you can do really well at it. And for medieval people, that's absolutely necessary because the idea is, even though the women are the horny ones, men, because they're hot and dry, if they don't have a sexual outlet, will become violent um, if they are unmarried. And so you have to provide them with brothels so they don't like riot and burn the city down, right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> and this is, this is like one of those things where I'm like, you know, maybe people are actually really smart and give them some credit. And then Thomas Aquinas comes at you with that. And you're like, all right, so, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so it, it doesn't make logical sense now, but this is what we're going. So you need these women in order to do this job. But there is this kind of concern about, well, what happens if they get pregnant? And they're like, well, lucky you, right? Because, uh, well, one of the things that they're like, well, they can't get pregnant because sex workers hate their job. <laughs> and they don't and they don't like having sex with you and the idea is there's the two seed theory uh, which hilariously aristotle doesn't believe in uh, but um, most people believe that uh, basically what happens when uh, cis men and women have sex is that when men orgasm they ejaculate and so do women and so like there is like women's semen that is expressed inside and then it mixes with men's semen and then that's how you get it right so it's like they're, so they're like so everybody's got an orgasm and then bada bing bada boom and they're like I show you sex workers are not orgasming. <laughs> like, like real talk, everybody. Uh, so like that, that's fine. So they're, that that's like one thing. And they're like, they they hate their job and you. So they're just like going to get through it. And like, that's fine. So and that's quite interesting. Um, and I think that we have to be really careful though when we talk about the two-seat theory in this because like some people get like a very basic interpretation of this. It's like, oh, isn't that great? They're really focusing on women's pleasure during sex. So I'm like, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's first place. Uh, because the, you know the kind of flip side of this is you have like terrible things that will happen. For example, if um, women are sexually assaulted and then they become pregnant as a result of it, they'll go, ah, you were having fun, you know. And, and so you, you can't possibly, you know, have actually been sexually assaulted. Although even their concept of rape is very different to ours. Basically, like your your dad didn't is you know the the consent meme. I consent. I consent. Your dad didn't. Isn't there someone who you grabbed ass basically? <laughs> um, and so. That, that kind of like comes to play with sex workers. Um, so they are like, they are women, but they are a very specific group of it. You do also see this as certainly um, class. So um, Andreas Capilanis, who writes De Amore or The Art of Courtly Love, you know, when he is like, here's how you seduce ladies. And it's a, it's just a pickup artist, an animal, absolutely brilliant, really cracking, can't recommend it enough. <laughs> um, you know, he writes these dialogues, model dialogues, and he'll say, like, here, if you're a middle class guy, this is how you pick up a middle class woman, a member of the lower nobility, a member of the upper nobility. And then, like, if you're a member of the lower or upper nobility, same thing again. And what they say about peasant women is that they are impossible to romance uh, because uh, they procreate like animals. 
Um, and they are incapable of like love and romance on the level that higher ups are. And so you should just rape them. And so it's like, there is this specific class thing about like, well, passengers are 85% of the European population um, and simply are not capable of, of um, love or romance or connection on this level, which is also, I mean, to a certain extent true because the peasants a lot of times Peasant women have more freedom in a lot of things. Like, you know, they're a lot more able to decide who they want to marry. Um, they are a lot more able to uh, kind of like have control about like where it is they go and what they do. Whereas like nobility are essentially like prisoners of their fathers, right? And then you go and you do what it is that they tell you to do. And then you have courtly love romance, which is essentially the affairs that you have behind your husband's back, right? So yeah, like peasant women are incapable of doing that because like they get to marry the dude they want to all the time, right? So that's true, but it's all right. Um, in terms of race, race is such a difficult one um, in the medieval period because they don't have the same kind of concept of race as we do. Although they will talk about, you know, like thing being is something being in people's blood. So for example, they'll say that like Jewish people, are, like if, you know, they've, you've got two days in your blood or something. And it, interestingly, there what we tend to see is like a kind of tension, especially like Jewish writers. There's a real worry on the, the behalf of the Jewish male writers uh, that Jewish women all want to have sex with Christian men, um, which is quite interesting. Ruth Master Paris has written a lot about this, where there is there's an idea that um, because uh, Christian men are not circumcised, whereas Jewish men are, they think that uh, circumcision makes penises more sensitive. Uh, and therefore, uh, Jewish men don't last as long having to create some giant sex as Christian men do. So, like, your your wife is going to like run off and leave you for a Christian guy. So there is this real kind of like, ooh, kind of thing there. And and it, this also plays out a lot of time on on the Iberian Peninsula. Real kind of concerns about mixing across religions, which they kind of see as race, um, because it, it's sort of like, are you within Christendom or are you without? And can you anyone ever really be converted? Who's going to convert? Who are like Muslim women who are fun and sexy? Like noted, like the fun and sexy ones are like uh, Muslim girls. And there's a real kind of worry also that um, women will convert to Islam because it's easier and uh, you get to be fun and sexy mm -hmm. if you're a Muslim woman. Whereas if you're a Christian woman, your dad's gonna lock you in a tower, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but like Muslim girls get to go to parties and like become doctors and do all sorts of things that Christian women aren't allowed to. So a real tension around how you protect your women from these like nefarious other races but you know religions yeah, yeah i guess staying on, on women's jobs you mentioned doctors and and actually eleanor reichner was famously a seamstress wasn't she so i, I guess what, what are the other because obviously again another misconception is that women didn't work before now <laughs> you know? and, and that they only lived in the domestic sphere like what kinds of jobs did did women have in the medieval period the answer is yes uh, so basically if there's a job women did it and more to the point like the entire the so you know women will become wives and mommies and one half that expectation is like the mother bit but the other half is you get married because she's going to help you with your job so like whatever your job is, she also does. And then also more specifically on top of that, she also runs the books, which is quite interesting where like there's this really, um, uh, this idea that um, maths and bookkeeping is feminine. And it was really interesting because I had um, a student ask me about this when I was talking about it the other day. And she was like, wow, how do they square that with the fact that, you know, mathematics is so hard, but women were the ones who were doing it. And I was like, oh, because it's a social construct that mathematics is hard. You know, and we and now that men do it, we go, it's very hard. Your little brain couldn't do it, right? No, like, but when women were doing it, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah whatever, right? It's like, and you see this all the time, right? And in terms of how careers play out, right? The minute you get a kind of critical mass of women in something, suddenly it's easy. Um, we can see history or academia writ large for more information. Um, and then also the opposite is true, you know, where you do get a critical mass of men, then suddenly, oh, it's very tricky, and, like, you couldn't possibly do it. That, which is computing, right? Um, but women are doing quite literally everything. If you're talking about peasants, there's not like there isn't really a kind of gendered way of separating farm work. Um, there are things that end up being a little more of uh, women. So if, like women are more likely to do kind of like animal husbandry and like they're they're looking after the kids. Like men are not gonna look at their children ever. Uh, <laughs> apparently, it's like they they kind of get interested in them when they're getting educated. 
but like a, a baby is screaming a mandolin every day. Um, but uh, you know, maybe plowing is a little bit more masculine. But if you've got a really small farm, it's going to take two of you, and so like you know, you'll be out there. And plenty of women run their own farms, so they're the ones who do their own plowing. Um, and then there are like really feminized kind of bits of labor on top of that. So like brewing, as for that's one for the ladies. Um, so like women brew beer all the time, or ale. Uh, that that's incredibly feminized. And sewing, uh, cloth making, like to the point where some of the only guilds that are all women are usually like silk guilds where men are not allowed to make silk, which is quite interesting, right? It's like there is this one industry that's incredibly lucrative that men aren't allowed in. Um, they're also artisans, they do a lot of uh, art. Um, and then, you know, there's like, you know, the bourgeois jobs we kind of talk about. Anybody who is um, in a guild, their wife does the same job. And then when you get up to the level of nobility and things, you're, you've got like really high level diplomatics that's happening that women do. Um, and also they lend money. It's quite interesting. Like a lot of money stuff is physically like back and forth with women um, because it comes along with the bookkeeping. So you'll see like a noble women who are like lending money to the crown. Um, so it, it is quite interesting because I do, you know, you know you're absolutely right that there, there is a tendency to act as though women entering the, the workforce is new. And I'm like, no, there was like this small, small blip which peaked in the Edwardian period of women not working. And it's an enlightenment thing because like Bertrand Russell is like, scientifically, ladies are in the house. And I'm like, okay, and, like, it's like, it, it, and they're like, it's science. Um, and, but then even then it's very important, I think, to, to point out that that was only true for bourgeois women. So like working class women were working. Right? That's the thing, right? So, and then and, and also really wealthy women were also working. You know, there was diplomacy happening, you know, uh, the queen had a job. Question mark. Right? <laughs> no, I wouldn't trade with her. But I mean, like, like but you gotta say the perks are good, right? So, but it, it is still a job, right? So, women at that level were also really working. So, it is a real expectation that only kind of like existed in the salons and everything. And for this tiny, tiny blip of time, and we're actually just kind of like going back to what the norm is, but we act like we're being radical for it, right? I think this is. My last question before we open it up to all of you. So have a think of what you want to ask. Um, and yeah, this is just one that I would like to ask. Um, the medieval period is really like a storytelling. It's, it's very interested in, in anecdotes. And, and I feel like the book, because of that, is sort of jam-packed with kind of like hilarious and also horrifying <laughs> stories. Um, and I was wondering, do you have a favorite medieval story? <laughs> okay. Yes, <laughs> but I have so many, but it's actually hard, but one of my favorites is Pepla. Um, and it, it, this is a story where you're like, you know how women are, right? So there's a, there's a woman who's married to a fisherman. And uh, the fisherman thinks that she doesn't really love him. And she's only in it for the sex. Um, and she's only in it for the sex. And, and, the, and, and she's like, no, baby, I love you really, but also I'm in it for the money. And he's like, you're not in it for the money. Don't lie to me, you're in it for the sex, which apparently it would be better. If she was in it for the money, I don't know. So that's good. Anyway, in order to test this, and one day the fisherman's out fishing and the corpse of a priest floats by normal. Um, so he's like, I'm going to steal this priest's dick. And um, like he goes home with, like he cuts the, the dick off this corpse. He goes home and shows it to his wife. And it's like, it's been a horrible accident. I lost my dick. And she's immediately like, hey, screw you, buddy. I'm out of here. <laughs> I hate you. This is barely you. You're no good to me. This is the worst day of my life. I can't believe this has happened to me. And he's like, ha ha, got you. Stole a priest's corpse dick. <laughs> and she's like, oh, thank God. Like, oh, I love you so much. And he's like, yeah, yeah I can't trust women. I, I just I, I love everything about this. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's the proof of like how horny women are, which, you know, I love very much. Also, yeah, you know, like, yeah, when confronted with a priest's corpse, like, I mean, it's feel to be like, that's like, what? <laughs> I'm right on little ruse, you know? And, and the way this is also just, for, the way that this is all presented is just like, well, women do be fucking, you know? And, and, and it's like, this is all normal, and like, I think it, it's also really good and useful because a lot, like, one of the misconceptions about the Middle Ages is that everyone is pious, and they just, and they all they do is, like, love God, and if the church wrote something down, they all believe in it, they're like, out here with the penis stealing story. <laughs> so like, I love this for them. It's just one of my absolute favorites, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Right, so we're going to open it out to audience questions now, if anyone has one. <laughs> the church kind of imposed this thing and they had a hard time enforcing it like men literally ride it because they couldn't get married Oh, sorry. Um, or at least priests rather get married. Oh, and then um, no, I just want you to repeat the question oh, <laughs> just so that people at home can hear hear it. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if so, you want to summarize and Yeah, absolutely. So the question is about um if the book talks about clerical celibacy, which is an incredibly well, let's just say up for question <laughs> by by and priests hate it, and there was a for a long time priests were not celibate. When they enforce it especially kind of like this is the gregorian reform thing um it's like uh, one for the real heads uh so that if i talk about that and i do i don't get to talk as much as i'd like to about how angry they were about it but one of the things that i'm specifically interested in talking about is how you know the clerical celibacy thing is quite interesting especially if what we're talking about is ideas of women's sexuality right because um we're meant to understand that like there's all these um you know, horny women doing like disastrously sexy things. And it's like written by a bunch of guys who are like, yeah, I bet they're, oh, what are they doing? You know, and, <laughs> so in particular, I talk about, and I'm sure, you know, you, you know about it, but um, uh, Bouchard of Worms, uh, a corrector, which is, a, it's a, a, a penitential, which is kind of like a handbook for a priest to say, like, what did you do? But it also like gets the conversation rolling. And it's like, ask the girls if they're using dildos. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, hey, you got a strap on, girl? <laughs> Strapping on you and your girlfriends to get together with strap. <laughs> and this is quite interesting because in the first place, it's like, I have a strap on. So it's like, you know, we're, we're really not so different. Uh, but <laughs> also at the same time, it's quite interesting because it's like, well, is this like a reflection of something that is quite common? Or is this like the oversexed imagination of a guy who's not supposed to be having sex? So he's like, I imagine this is what's happening with all women, right? And, and so it's like, the, the group of people who should not be commenting on what women do because in theory they should be doing it, right? I mean, say Augustine, maybe. Like I'll give it to you because like he was a real slut. And, and, until, like, he, and then he's like, oh, I repent and everything. And so like, so he knows what he's talking about, right? To, to an extent. <laughs> but it is this really interesting thing where, you know, like kind of like shout out, as I say, like the difficulty of like getting priests to have, stop having sex, which they never, they never do uh ever but still not uh so it, like it is one of these really difficult things but yeah, i feel like in a way i almost need to do like a, a book about dudes like you know the dudes rock companion so <laughs> this one about like how like all of the like the, all the interesting workarounds that they come up with like i'm still i'm still talking about prop uh, but the same uh penitential that's got the donka and, and everything in it there's this one priest where everyone's like our priest keeps having sex with sex workers could you do something about it and they're like homie could you please stop having sex with sex workers he's like yeah i have sex with sex workers but i send them home after i'm done <laughs> and, and he's like so that's fun like and so he's understanding of how like clerical celibacy works is like well if she doesn't stay over <laughs> like that's okay um and like to be fair a lot of his colleagues are having them stay over like in that they have started a brothel you know, <laughs> you know so, it is really, really interesting and so difficult to get people to understand that, they, you know, like that, that, that it's interesting because everyone hates the medieval church that they've made up in their minds, but also they can't possibly understand that these guys are also possibly hypocrites. So I'm like, you know, and that's our own weird thing where I'm like, how can you not understand that those two things coexist? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Someone else go to... uh, very similar question also from us. Medieval slash early modern. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, sort of in this conversation of imposing, sort of using the church as a structure to carry out other um, values regarding sexuality and, and um, specifically women's roles. And, you know, we, the perfect woman, woman is Mary, who is both a virgin and a mother. Perfect. Yeah, so the, the, ideal. Yeah. Yeah, how do we sort of figure with these um, 
I'm sorry, I'm wording this poorly. How do you figure with um the creation of sort of monasteries for women or or nunneries, like mm. in that carving out of female space? How is that sort of regarded in this larger context? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. So um, it's a question about uh, the churches trying to grapple with what you do with women, uh, you know, like because they're they're so difficult and what that how that does shakes out for um, nunneries or other religious communities, uh, and also with just the figure of the Virgin Mary, which is why she's on the front cover here, uh, like being the perfect woman who is both a mommy and not a slut. Uh, so somehow, question like she did it, uh, like. You know, she jumped through that theological loophole and she did it, you know, so like these ladies that could be you somehow. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really quite interested in uh, medieval religious women because there is this this kind of like dichotomy of also being the right sort of religious woman, right? Where, uh, you know, I talk about uh, Hillary Rodham Bingham a lot in the book because how could she not, right? But I'm also quite interested in how really she's monitored so closely by men and it's sort of like do we like this do we not like this you know like is this useful for the church or isn't it and essentially she's kind of allowed to do what she does because they come down on the side of this is quite useful for us so we'll we'll take it granted um and so one of the things that i talk about in here as well is a begin and and how that really comes up a lot so for those who don't know begins it's kind of like um a lay order of religious women so if like, an ordinary woman wants to just like have a nice religious time, you can become a bikini, especially in the later medieval period. And they just kind of hang out and do holy stuff. Um, it, it, it's confusing. And sometimes the church likes this. Like we've got example of like bikini saints where they're like, yeah, that's great. Like she was married and then she's like, I'm not gonna have sex with my husband anymore. And also I sleep on a board and tie a rock around my middle. And I only eat bread that cuts my mouth. And, and everyone's like, and the church's like, this is holy. Yes. <laughs> but then there are other uh, beings. So uh, it's Marguerite Porette who writes uh, The Mirror of Simple Souls where she comes up with some ideas where she's like, God is love and is a mystic force that you yeah, the church are like, you are a heretic and you're gonna die now. Right? So it's like, um, it, it's, is it useful? Right. And I think that that's kind of like one of the things like with the way that women are considered in general in well in general I was about to say in the medieval period but I'm like yeah no like it's it does this kind of benefit the society as is and if what the woman is doing upholds the status quo fine great if there's kind of some benefit but if it is carving like a genuinely new path or introducing a, a really radical new idea that can get shut down very quickly if it isn't of use to anyone. So it's a really kind of very simple use case. And I mean, I realize, you know, that I'm a historical materialist, so obviously that's gonna be my answer to everything. But, um, you know, you can, you, this is how it checks out. It's like, how do we stop that? And also, you know, with uh, religious groups more generally, you know, right? Like if you think about sort of like the poor Clares who are the answer to the Franciscans. And the entire reason you come up with Franciscans is they're like, oh, we'd like some monks who work with the community. And then when it's like, and then poor players, no, you may not work with the community because I'm assuming you're going to be horny, right? And then so like they're they still in close. So there's always this extra monitoring and this extra, like, how is this going to kind of damage us? Like the, the damage control that the church is always kind of thinking about with religious women. I, I think it's quite instructive. Thank you. Um, we have one from online oh. um, from Laura, who's watching from Inverness. Um, and they were wondering if there was anything you discovered when writing this book um, that you found particularly interesting at all. Ah, so Laura would like to know if there's anything that I discovered while writing this book that I found particularly interesting. Or surprising. Or surprising. Um, yeah, I was really interested in learning more about the guidebooks that dads write for their daughters. Um, which is really interesting. So and one of one of the big ones is it's a very boring name, but it's the book of the night of the Tower of Landry, and um, he's a wife guy, and his wife dies, and he's like, I miss my wife. She was so great, and she he writes this big book that is like, girls be like your mom, and I'm gonna write down how you be like your mom. Um, and it's so interesting because it's like all of these little things where he's like, now you might think that being attractive is the most important thing because that's what society is telling you constantly. But it's not. And actually what you should do is not look around the room when you're like meeting guys because guys hate it when you look around the room. Uh, and this is really interesting to me because I'm like, 
what are like the decorum rules and all these things about like what would make an ideal life but the ideal life is one who doesn't look around the room and you're like okay and then, great that you think this is interesting so like the trad you know ideas about like how you become a really a uh, marriageable woman are so far out there like from what you would ordinarily expect you know and you know you, you expect the kind of things about like yeah be a good mom and get ready to read the bible like sure we expect that but uh don't look around the room like that's a new one to me. <laughs> um and also i like all the threats in them which are weird so they've got all these great uh stories where they're like Did you wear makeup young lady and they're like there was a beautiful duchess and everyone thought she was beautiful but it turned out she was wearing makeup and so her whole face collapsed when she died and now she's in hell and it's like oh okay right it's like, and it, it's just that, that also is like just kind of really is very funny to me in terms of like uh open house christians now in their relationship to women in makeup because you've got kind of like two ways of doing it where sometimes open house christians are like don't you wear that makeup but then um uh, Fun fact, from when I lived in Australia, the Hillsong Church used to give makeup courses to 16-year-old girls, which is not at all creepy. Uh, so, you, you know, like, there there are all these, like, little ways that Christians now are kind of traveling with this, but not as terrible, Andrew. He wants his daughter to not wear makeup and not look around the room, and then, like, it's all going to be fine. They're going to be a good mother, right? And so I, I love uh, just the, the idea of a dude writing this kind of thing for his daughter's now is kind of beyond me. So I love that one. It's really fun. Oh yeah, so this is about the, the the idea of the dark ages where um I got great hair booty shorts that will stop all this for everyone. Uh but uh so yeah, they it, very interesting because uh, the term dark ages was actually coined by Caesar Baronius in the 17th century. Um and interesting it's supposed to be about um I think that specifically the 10th century where we just don't, we have a paucity of sources there, right? And they, it was like it's really difficult to write about the 10th century because why aren't there any sources? And then eventually it was adopted by other historians to talk about just the early Middle Ages. So kind of like up until like basically fall of Rome to Charlotte, essentially. But because then you hit the Carolingian Renaissance and you get a lot more texts, right? Um, and then, you know, unfortunately you get Voltaire, uh, who I will see in hell. Uh, and, and he like and he does he writes all these like they're just ridiculous things about like oh the era of the dark ages when the church was under your bed and everyone was stupid not like me i'm very smart and um this gets adopted really wildly especially in our society and like and especially within Protestant societies who are desperate to tell you about how the church would come and arrest you right and also what it kind of does and allows people to do is just ignore the middle ages if they don't want to deal with it and um, people don't want to deal with the Middle Ages because it's complex and it's messy. And one thing that's true over here isn't necessarily true over there. Sure, there's overarching structures like the church and philosophy and things like that. But you know what? To be honest, like what's going on in Barcelona is not what's going on in Stockholm, right? Um, so it's like, yep, let's not talk about that. Um, and then also there is, you know, just the fact that we're living in a kind of like imperialist colonial society. So it's very important that everyone understands that the like violent slave society. Rome was excellent. It was really good when there were all the slaves, you know. Um, and so you to ignore the bit in between. It was bad. It was bad, right? But that's not what it was supposed to mean, and that's not how historians use it, right? But I see it happen all the time. Right? If I allow myself to be baited into arguments, um, you know, and when I'll say, you know, well, yeah, the term dark ages refers to a lack of sources, uh, not intellectual decline. I feel really like. Well, why was there a lack of sources? Because the church burnt all the books. And I'm like, literally, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? And that's, but that's the first place their head goes. That you wouldn't have sources from them because the church burnt the books. And I'm like, it's just um a thousand years ago is a really long time. Like I just I think that maybe you just don't understand what a thousand years is. I mean, what I always kind of say is like, you know, when you move house, like we're back when there was, you know, paper bills. Do you keep your electricity bills? No. Well, people have moved house a lot of times for a thousand years. And if, if something isn't important, they don't keep it, right? And that's kind of how these things happen. And the people who are wealthy enough to keep sources are like royal people in the church. And so that's why we get to hear lots about what they have to say and like not about ordinary people who are also not literate. And that doesn't make people stupid. 
but it does make my job really hard because people are like, why should I have to know about this? Everyone is stupid. And also, um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one because, uh, you know, that people will be like, well, I think it is the dark ages because the black death was really bad. And I'm like, yeah, it was. I mean, but I don't know. That's nothing to do with what we're talking about, right? But this idea that if something is bad in that way or dark, then you can ignore it is quite interesting, um, but also really difficult to kind of refute. Um, I try to just kind of like, uh, be having fun with it, I guess, is the idea, because if you point out how there's all the, you know, like, who doesn't love a good priest corpse penis that story, right? <laughs> like, if you, if you bring these things out, that it allows people to see that, like, actually, it's it's a quite interesting time, and, like, the only thing you can really do about it, I think, is highlight uh, how it's fun and interesting, and you've got to bring people in, you can't really argue them down, you've just got to say, well, here's what you could have won, I guess. <laughs> Um, nearly 20 years ago, my university lecturer um, said that whenever the church talked about sex, it was actually about property. Um, what what would you... <laughs> okay. yeah. you agree with that? Uh, yeah, so the question is here that apparently a, a university lecturer who is very good said that uh, when the church talks about sex, they're talking about property. And I think that there's a lot to this, right? Because it's like, so the, the right way to have sex is um, to ensure that there are new people to whom property will be passed, right? The only acceptable form of sex is sex that is going to allow for children within marriage, specifically. So yeah, there's, there is a lot to that because all of the prohibitions around sex, it's like the kinds that are fun that you don't get pregnant from, right? Uh, so they're like, don't you do that. You better make a baby right now. That's all your last to them, you know? And, uh, yeah, damn, that's good. Uh, I'm taking that. Uh, I, will, I will say that I didn't make it up though. Uh, but yeah, it, it, and this is really true. So, like, one of the things that the church really fears, and I think this is still true, uh, is is sex for the sake of sex, right? So, sex for the sake of pleasure is the thing that is ultimately the most sinful. So, it spends all this time kind of like browbeating people into having procreative sex. They're like, please, just I swear to God, stop having oral sex. And, Medieval people are like, no. <laughs> what, and one of the things that I really love about that is that, um, you know, uh, sodomy, which is any kind of sex that can result in pregnancy, that's what medieval people were like, yeah, like that's what I want. I want a hand job, right? Like they're like, um, I would like to do frottage. Like, and that's what's really, really sexy for them, right? And I'm super interested in the fact that now the way that we talk about uh, sex, especially when we're talking about like heterosexual sex, is like, it's not real. Unless you have penis and vagina sex, and I'm like, the church won. It's amazing. Like, like Thomas of Wine is one, right? Like they spent thousands of years being like, please, I just swear to God, take that dick out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and now, like, the, the, like ultimately, in the age that where we're supposed to be enlightened and have sex for fun, they, their view has prevailed, right? And I think there's almost kind of something there where we're still, you know, the reason it's okay to talk about sex when it is okay to talk about sex is in this like procreative thing. So even, you know, if we're talking about just versus about uh, sex ed, uh, or for example, it's like, oh, well, we need to have medically accurate sexual education where it's like, so talk about where babies come from. And I'm like, how is this radical, right? Like how is it radical to just talk about like that's what, what sex does? Uh, but yeah, it, it, so we're still reproducing the same, the same idea about like how you need to be creating more heirs, how you need to pass on property. And I mean, it, it's, uh, this is a great new way of kind of thinking about the whole Everything is sex except the everything is sex, except sex which is power. You know, right? It's uh, the same thing, but you know, with money. So yeah, I like this very much. Thank you very much. This, this has been great for me. Thank you. <laughs> call, it, call it there, which is the perfect moment to end, I think. Um, thank you so much. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking Alan.